inside. Hallelujah, because he's worthy. Yeah, come on, sing this with us today. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our glory, hallelujah. Every praise. 
as we continue on with worship, we're so thankful that our guest worship leader, Jamel Strong, is here. Come Thank on, you, Father. Come on, lift your voice as a trumpet in this house as we magnify the name of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I don't care what you left at the house. You have the victory over it in the name of Jesus. There's an exchange we can make, Isaiah tells us. Beauty for ashes, all of joy for mourning. And guess what? For the spirit of heaviness, he said we can play on the garment of praise. Do I have any radical praises this morning? Woo! We got joy. Hallelujah, we lift your name, Father. Mm -hmm. Listen, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness, in the darkness I'll dance. In the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. For the waters, for the waters rise. We gonna lift your name, God, and we praise you. No matter what's going on in our lives, we lift you high, Father. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, thank you for the joy. Let's say it together. Oh, the tears. Hallelujah. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise. My song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise. My song will rise. While there's breath in my lungs. There's breath in my lungs.
joy of the Lord is not a condition of what's going on exteriorly, but the joy of the Lord is the condition, amen, of who I am according to the word by faith. And I don't care what you're going through. How many people know that you have the joy of the Lord to strengthen you? Hallelujah. Let that say, Hallelujah. This is my response. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Speak it right now. Hallelujah. Coming past to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, Jesus, you.
chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. To break every What a powerful name, what a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. Your name, oh, what a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is. Would you sing again? What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Powerful name. What a powerful name it is. Nothing. Nothing can stand. Just take a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, on this rainy Sunday, come on, can you just press in for a moment? Man, just shake off the week, shake it off. Man, set your attention. We put our gaze. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. Every knee bows. Every tongue confesses of things in the earth, things under the earth. And every tongue confesses, Lord, you are Lord Jesus. Jesus. Lord, we bless you. We bless you today. Father, thank you. That, Lord, there's the gathering point. It's under your name. That, Lord, even Paul would say that everyone who even names the name, flee, depart from iniquity. Just everything that represents who you are, God, that's what you came. You came to change us. You came to shape us into your image. By your spirit, you, you came to... Lord, do a work in us that we become representers of who you are. We thank you today. We thank you, Jesus. Could you, by faith right now, and just as an act of surrender, could you just lift a hand? It's that, it's that yada. It is that opening your palms. It's taking your hands off of everything and saying, here, Lord, I surrender to you. I give it all to you. I give it all to you, Jesus. Powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. Powerful name it is. Your name, name of Jesus. Just sing to him, man. Oh, what a powerful name it is. Nothing, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name. Could you sing one more time? What a powerful name it is. Oh, what a powerful name it is. Your name. The name of Jesus Christ, my Oh, Lord, what a powerful name it is. Nothing can say. Name of 
everybody thankful for Jesus today? Come on. Man, if you're at church at home, whatever you're doing, just take a moment, get a praise break. Come on, lift your voice today. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you today. <laughs> Say this to me, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. I'm so thankful for that because I woke up this morning and I knew I needed his mercy. And it was new this morning. So neighbor, I don't know about you, but I really can tell by looking at you, you needed some mercy today. Is that right? Come on, would you go find about five or 10 people around if you're giving high five, air five, elbow, whatever you're giving. Come on, go greet somebody today. Would you do that? Good morning, Rock family. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay, you can do better than that. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, it's a good day to be here. I know it's raining outside, but it is, it is bright on the inside of this church. Amen. We're going to have an awesome day today. I'm excited about all of the great things that are going to happen today. You, we're just going to hear a dynamic message here in just a second. In fact, we're going to join in with all of our campuses here in just about a couple of minutes. Before we do that, I want to make sure that I highlight a couple of things that I just need to mention to you. First of all, uh, we want to make sure that you know that uh, if you have not already signed up for our life group, it is not too late. We just kicked off our life group uh, season that started this last Wednesday. And uh, this is another invitation just to let you know that it's not too late. Uh, to sign up, to be a part of that. Maybe you've been thinking about it, praying about it. We had an awesome time, a few hundred, gosh, about 300 people here on the property on Wednesday just being invested into. There's classes, opportunities, and I just want to say kudos for all of those uh, all of those teachers and people that have been putting the time and the effort in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm excited that this life group season is just going to be a fruitful one. Amen. So if you are interested in signing up for that, maybe you haven't found out any information. Maybe it's the first time you're hearing about it. I encourage you to go out to the info booth. You can sign up today with uh, Pastor Terry and Cheryl Bennett. They're here on the front row, but they'll be guiding you through that process. So we encourage you to go out and be a part of that. Can we do something real quick? Can we recognize all of our first time guests today? If you're here for the first time, you don't mind letting us know about it, would you just wave at us? We don't want to embarrass you, but we'd love to recognize you today. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, church. You can do better than that. I see you there. It's an honor to have you here today. It's good to see you. We know that you could be anywhere you chose to be here. That means so, so much to us. And uh, please, 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 uh, our ushers are looking for you today. They have an invitation uh, for a little reception right after service that we'd like to just uh, make available to you. Come by and just have a little something before you go out and have lunch. And that'll give us a chance to introduce ourselves personally. A few of our pastors and elders will be back there. And uh, it give you a chance to ask any questions you might have. And uh, Again, just it's a it's a little little reception that we get to just greet one another. So thank you for being here today. We're such we're just an honor to have you here today. All right, hey, uh, listen, it's offering time. We get to give, amen. We get to give. Oh man, listen, we we clap around here when it's offering time because we know this that there's nothing that we have that doesn't come from Him, amen. There's nothing that isn't being given to us that God hasn't entrusted to us. And my prayer is this, Lord, would you expand my capacity? Does anybody else just want to steward well what he puts in your hands? That's, that's where I'm at. So if your husband and wife would you join hands, we just want to pray over you, pray over our church family. Ask God that he would just continue to pour out his blessings on us as we just continue to give him honor. Amen? And uh, let's do that today. If you did come prepared to give, you can do that. You can see it on the screen here. You can use the QR code. You can also, if you came prepared to give cash check or something like that, we have drop boxes at the back doors on your way out. You're welcome to do it that way. Um, let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we honor you. We lift you up. We magnify you above all things. God, we absolutely trust and honor you. We don't ever want to move beyond this place, God, and not give you credit for all that you've done and all that you've accomplished. We love you, Jesus. God, we, we are so grateful today. We're asking you now, God, that you would just continue to pour out your spirit on us. I pray for all of our families who are stepping out in faith today. God, I pray that you would overwhelm them with your goodness and your faithfulness. 
God, we thank you for all of the single moms and dads. Today we come into agreement with a covenant God. We just pray your spirit to, to just surround them in this season, God. I pray as they're doing their job, raising up good godly young men and women, God, I pray that you would just pour out a rich, rich blessing over them. God, I pray that every need that they have, God, would just be met in you. God, we thank you for that. God, we lift up every business owner to you today. God, we thank you for creative and witty ideas. We thank you for, for vision. God, we thank you for fresh vision. I thank you for the platforms and the opportunities that you've given our business leaders. God, I pray that they would steward it well, God. I pray that they would trust you in every season of their company. And God, I pray as you bless them, they become a blessing to their employees, making it very difficult to look for another job because it's just so good. God, I thank you for pouring out your spirit over our businesses today. And God, lastly, we pray for those who are looking for a job, those who are going door to door, filling out applications. Our prayers, that application would rise to the top, opportunity would come. God, that you would be glorified and your kingdom advance, and we'll give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. All right, are you ready for the word this morning? Pastor Russ is going to come up and introduce our speaker. Would you welcome all of our guests? As soon as this video is done, I want you to give it up for our guests and give it up for our campuses as we join them live, okay? Watch this. for all of our campuses today joining us, Madison, Fayetteville, Smith Lake, online. Come on, we, you know, I really think, yeah, come on, man. You know, you know, I used, when I was a youth pastor, and I still remember those days, I, I remember, actually, I started graying when I was 23, when I became a youth pastor. It, it began all back then. I, I'm not going to go into a huge uh, story on that, but you know, I used to do a thing on a day like today. You know, sometimes you wake up, you got to just shake yourself. I mean, on a rainy day, you, you, can, you, can, you can tend to not to let your spirit get kind of, you can look at your soul and say, come on, you need to just magnify a little bit the Lord. And I used to call it, Paul said, I buffet my body, bring it under subjection, lest my, I used to call it a buffetation. You know, sometimes you just got to buffetate yourself. And wake up. So look at your neighbor and say, you better get ready for the word today, man. God's got something for you. And uh, But before I introduce, just not just necessarily a guest here anymore, I think he's a part of the family, and, uh, and I'm so excited about having Dr. Rock, Mark Rutland with us today. But we have in the house today our interns, our MC interns that all got in yesterday. Their families moved them in. And um, we've got a, we got a crew of about 25 team that God has brought us for these 10 months. And I want them to stand. And can you give it up for all of our interns that are coming in for the next 10 months? We love you guys. All of their families, thank you for trusting us with your student. And, um, and it's going to be an amazing, amazing year. And uh, we love you guys. For many of them, this is a gap year. And they're just, uh, they come out of high school, you can be seated. And um, God is just going to really, it's a, it's a discipleship program that I believe is going to impact everything that God takes them to do the rest of their life. And, uh, and we're so thankful that you guys are going to be with us for this year. Well, right now, it is such an honor to have Dr. Mark Rutland with us. Over the last, last month, we are um, hosting his Leadership Institute which is a training of leaders, both business and church leaders. Uh, it's a, a three-month um, journey with him on three days a month. Uh, after that, it, it actually has the teeth of getting, um, you can apply 12 to 13 hours of credit for a master's program. But he is a gift to the body of Christ. He and Miss Allison, his wife, are the founders of Global Servants and the House of Grace, which is a home for tribal girls that are being threatened with sexual slavery in uh, Thailand. They've been doing that for many, many years. Also, God has used him not only as a pastor and missionary, 
but he has God has given him a gift to be able to take things and see things turn around. He took Southeastern University a number of years ago and watched a miracle happen now that it is a thriving university uh, around, the, around the nation. And then taking on an iconic college by the name of Oral Roberts University a few years back and taking that school and seeing them turn around and be a thriving campus today. He's done that with churches. He's done that with leaders he is, um, he is a man that if I just get to hang out with him a little while, it, it, it impacts my life, always has. And today, he's going to be introducing a new book that he's launching today. This will be the second or third one he has launched here at our campus, the third one. And the very first time you'll get to hear it today, we get to hear it here and online and at our campuses. Would you please give a warm Rock Family Worship Center welcome to Dr. Mark Rutland as he comes. Would you do that? Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a joy to be here. I love this church. I love the spirit here. Um, I love the spirit of worship that is in this house. Um, I, I, people, one of the reasons people don't like me to come to their church is I can't quit analyzing. I teach church leadership, so it's like going to a cop movie with a policeman. They ruin everything. You ever, you ever done that? You know, be right at the exciting moment in the movie, and the cop will lean over and say, that's not procedure. Yes. <laughs> so I tend to analyze and I, I watch what's going on in a church. In any church, the first two rows are going to worship no matter what, even if the Antichrist is leading the worship. They'll, they'll. <laughs> but when the worship reaches the back row of the risers, that's when, that's when I know the worship is in the house. And I was kept turning around and looking at you, and I know you thought I was analyzing you. I was. <laughs> and my analysis says the spirit of worship is in this house. Amen? Well, a lot of people, a lot of people don't like these kind of rainy days with flood warnings. I, I, when I was a pastor, I loved those because it allowed me to separate. I didn't know how to separate the sheep from the goats. But uh, a day like this does it. Because today you know who loves Jesus. The goats are home asleep. All right. Well, I'm delighted to be back with you. I, I, I want to thank Pastor Rusty for letting me do book premieres. Your publisher, one's publisher, always wants to do a book tour. So I have a book tour schedule that runs all through the fall with this new book. And I've, I've done, this is my 20th book. They just came. So I've done this. But your publisher always wants you to start with a splash. Start somewhere where, you know, where people are receptive and that really wants you. And so I've inflicted, I've, I've introduced three at this church. And this is the third one. And uh, I, do so, I do so hope that you will get it and that it will be a blessing to you. I'm going to speak. I'm not going to read from the book this morning. Nothing would be more t tedious than that. But I'm, I'm going to speak on the topic of this. Uh, it's called, the, the new book is called Of Kings and Prophets. And I'll talk to you about what the book is about as I preach. But this is my 20th book. I hope you'll get it. Uh, then uh, we have also back there another book. I kind of think of these as bookends. They're not about the same subject. But this is a, a book that was a huge, huge seller for us. And we premiered this book here as well. So many of you already have it. But this is David the Great, which is the life and leadership of King David. And uh, the book people at the book table have asked me to announce that uh, your first copy of, of Kings and Prophets is $20. As is David the Great, you can get both of them for $30. Or if you just want to get multiple copies of of Kings and Prophets. The first book is 20, and after that, all that you want are 10. They also asked me to announce that I would be out there to sign books, and I will. I'll sign all. If you buy a thousand of them, I'll sign them all. Um, somebody asked me if my hand ever gets tired signing books. I said, never. My hand gets tired signing checks. It'll just, 
get where I can hardly hold the pen sometimes. But my signature in your book makes it used and therefore worthless. <laughs> but I have a special presentation. The, thir- the first book, I never saw one. They, it, we ran so close because everybody blames everything now on COVID. So the publisher said, COVID, we can't get the books printed, everything. I nearly had to cancel this. But we got them last night here. They were delivered here. So I had never seen one before. So it's always kind of a cool thing. You pull the first book out of the first box and you take that one home. But this time, I've signed this over to my friend and colleague, Rusty Nelson, and I would like to give you the very first book. I've spent, uh, I've spent the better part of my adult life um, Studying the discipline of communication. I teach communication. What, what makes communication work? When it works, why did it work? When it went south, what happened? What went wrong? I, I've discerned that really the discipline of communication comes down to four things. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. If you get any of those four variables wrong, it can all go wrong, really wrong, really fast. You can think that you're transmitting the correct message. But the message that is received may not be the message you thought you were transmitting. And the response that it solicits may not be at all what you hoped for. Every married man in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. There are times when you're transmitting what you think is a very clear and positive message. And from the look on her face, you can tell that while you're talking, the ice is cracking under your feet. I went to uh, preach a, a, a college graduation, a university graduation out in the Southwest recently. And uh, afterward, as I was coming out with a young vice president... Uh, one of the graduates who had just come by came by, and he just looked at me, and he said, he said, Dr. Rutland, that was dope. So I turned to the young vice president. I said, did he say that was dopey? And he said, no, he said that was dope. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, it means good. It means that was good. And I said, oh, I get it. Dope like, like cocaine or something is so... It's so good you can't get enough of it. You just want more and more. You get addicted to it. And he said, no, like, just good. Uh. (laughs) But I got to thinking about it. I got to thinking about what dope, that, there's a lot of implications there. I could just imagine some dark corner in Huntsville, Alabama, where some guy's standing there with a box on a table, and a, a car pulls up, and the guy lowers the window, and he says, you got any dope? I said, yeah. Got some CDs here by Rusty Nelson. <laughs> and the guy says, no, no, I, I, I want downers. Oh, he says, I got some John MacArthur tapes here. And <laughs> so turn to your neighbor and say, we hope this is dope. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, please, first of all, to the book of Hebrews. I want to read the first two verses of the book of Hebrews, and then we'll turn to the book of Revelation. Somebody asked me what version we were going to use. Okay, I'm not hung up on I don't have a religious. You don't have to have a King James Bible to go to heaven. One will be given you when you get there. But why stand in that long, embarrassing line? I'm just teasing. I'm always afraid somebody will take me and say, Amen. Amen. No, no. no, no. I, the kids at the universities used to ask me all the time, why do you always read from the King James Version? Part of it is loyalty. You know, I went to high school with King James. And... <laughs> Jimmy, we called him Jimmy. He wasn't a king in high school. The other is the, the flamboyant 
Shakespearean sound of it appeals to my creative spirit. All the these and thous that offend everybody else, I, I like it. I just can't get used to some of the modern versions where Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee and says to the disciples, it's happening, dudes. It's just me. But I'll be reading from King James. You follow me in whatever cheap communist imitation you've got. <laughs> all right, all right. This is serious message. By the way, just before I read the text, let me say this to you. It probably doesn't matter to you to hear this. It matters to me to say it. I, I do not take one penny from the sale of this book, any book, all 20 books sold worldwide. Even the royalty checks from the publisher go straight to Global Servants, all of it. One, no, no smoke and mirrors. I don't take anything for preaching here, nothing. All of that goes 100%. I'm on a salary as the director of the National Institute of Christian Leadership, and everything else I bring in goes to our girls' homes in Southeast Asia and West Africa. So I hope you'll go out there. Go out there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. Refinance your house. Steal the children's lunch money. Come on. You're a jolly crew this morning. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now turn, if you will, to Revelation chapter 19. Verses 9 and 10. And he saith unto me, he, he saith unto me, it, it means this powerful angel. It is, not, it is not the voice of God. It is an angel. And he saith unto me, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let's pray together. Padre glorioso, te damos gracias por tu presencia con nosotros en esta mañana. Porque te necesitamos mucho. Necesitamos un palabra de esperanza. Ayúdame, por favor. Lléname con tu Espíritu Santo y úsame a su gloria si es posible. Y por favor, glorifica tu nombre en este mensaje. Lord, we praise you. We worship you for this moment. We pray that you will glorify yourself in it and speak to our hearts, O oh Lord. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen and amen. The... The phrase that is bandied about everywhere now is to speak truth to power. But it's come to mean almost everything, and therefore it means almost nothing. Some nitwit movie star at the Academy Awards says what she knows is popular with everybody in the room. She gets a standing ovation, and her star rises even higher, if that's possible, and she is proclaimed as having spoken truth to power. When actually all she did is enhance her own popularity, saying what she knew the crowd would approve of. If you want to know what it means to speak truth to power, study the lives and ministries of the prophets. They spoke to real power. To ruthless kings and emperors who had the absolute unquestioned power of life and death. John the Baptist said to King Herod, Thou ought not to have this woman for thy wife. His, he married his brother's wife. Herodias became his wife. And John the Baptist denounced him and denounced him publicly. This is an illegal, immoral, and incestuous relationship. Of course, 
Herod arrested him and through the wickedness of Herodias and her daughter Salome, he was beheaded. One preacher said that he felt that John underestimated the anger of a woman who had been scorned publicly. Nonsense. John the Baptist was not some beguiled fool. He was a prophet who spoke truth to power and he knew the potential consequences. There are prophetic voices that are not necessarily prophets in the sense that Isaiah was a prophet or Jeremiah was a prophet. There are prophetic voices. On May the 26th, 1785, General George Washington, who was soon to become the first president of the United States, was at his home in Mount Vernon, and he wrote in his diary, Tonight I entertained at dinner two gentlemen, Thomas Koch. Dr. Koch, by the way, was a Welch physician who had been sent by John Wesley to the new nation of the United States to help the bishop of the United States, Francis Asbury. Any of you that grew up in the United Methodist Church, you know the small informal evening hymnal out of which we sang was called the Cokesbury Hymnal. It's a combination of the names of Thomas Koch and Francis Asbury, the two men that met with General Washington. General Washington wrote in his diary the next day, last night I entertained two gentlemen at dinner. Afterward, they left. That's all he wrote. But Francis Asbury wrote in his diary that they had appealed to General Washington to sign a petition denouncing slavery and to free his own slaves, that the new nation would begin with that kind of impetus toward absolute freedom. General Washington declined. That's all that Asbury wrote in his journal. What if, one cannot help but ask oneself, what if he had signed that petition and freed his slaves and spoken to the other slaveholders, great men, all the contemporary revisionist historians who want to say that they were horrible men are wrong. They were men of their generation, but they were slaveholders. Thomas Jefferson, what if he had sat down with Thomas Jefferson and said, let's do it. Let's change this. Let's change this nation from the very beginning. We'll never know. But perhaps less than a hundred years later, this nation wouldn't have erupted in civil war and hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Americans died to end a practice that potentially George Washington might have ended that night. I'm not saying that Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch were prophets. I'm saying that perhaps they spoke prophetically. Now, what does it mean to speak truth to power? First of all, one must have some level of access to power. Access to power is a gift. God opens the door for you or any of us or any in the Christian community to find special or intimate or accessible relationship with people that are in power. It's a gift. However, it is a dangerous gift. Because it must be used wisely and without fear and cognizant of its seductive power, the closer one draws to power, the more dangerous it is. And one must be aware of the necessary friction that's involved. The friction is between secular power and supernatural authority. When the prophets spoke to the kings... That's the reason this book is called Of Kings and Prophets. That's the whole substance of the book, the, the rub between secular power and, and supernatural authority. When, when the word comes forth to a person in power that is from God and of God and anointed with God's power, it's not always going to be comforting. It's not always going to be received positively. Herod did not like it. Herodias did not like it, and John the Baptist lost his head in his life. When John the Baptist's headless body lay on the floor of Herod's prison and his, and his head was served 
on a plate to a teenage girl who had danced seductively. All in the room laughed. But God did not laugh. God had sent his servant who had laid down his life. And he spoke truth to power. That friction is not just the substance of this new book. That friction is actually part of the fabric of all of our lives. All of us. There is that part of me that has power over my own life. There is something in me that along with the atheistic poet wants to say, I am the captain of my fate. I am the master of my soul. Something in me wants to be in possession of me. But truth to power says he is Lord. That really, that really is the sin of abortion. That is really what the sin of abortion is. It is certainly the sin of murder. But it is a twofold denial of the authority and power of God. It says that the woman's life does not belong to God and neither does the baby's life belong to God. If I have the choice over my own body, then why don't I have the choice over the body of the baby as well? So the real issue goes before murder. Murder is the consequence. It's the consequential action. But the real sin is the denial of the authority of God over that life. Who owns this life? In order to espouse and practice and authenticate the sin of abortion, I must first of all deny the supernatural authority of God. And that friction is rupturing a nation. I want to choose three this morning, just three interactions between a prophet and, and a king. First of all, choose Moses in his interaction with Pharaoh. It's easy to misunderstood what was happening there. Moses said to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. But he wasn't really dealing like Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch. He wasn't really trying to end the sin of slavery in Egypt. Presumably, Egypt had other slaves. Presumably, he wasn't, there were other slaves. That he wasn't dealing with them. What he was dealing with was what I just said about the issue of abortion. He was dealing with the possession of God. Pharaoh said... The Hebrew people are mine. I have the power of the disposition of their lives. They live where I tell them to live. They work at what I tell them to work at. They live and they die when I tell them to die. Remember, he was actually practicing the next step from abortion is infanticide. Which, by the way, some in this nation are endorsing. But... Pharaoh was practicing infanticide. He was telling the Egyptian midwives to, to kill the baby boys, the Hebrew baby boys when they were born. So he said, the Hebrew people are mine. I choose where they live. I choose whether they live. But God said, not just let all the slaves go. He said, let my people go. So the friction between Moses and Pharaoh was actually the friction over the ownership of the people of God. That issue is at the very heart of our own relationship with God. What you must ask yourself, what every one of us must ask ourselves this morning with regard to every appetite, with regard to every action, with regard to every other relationship in our lives is who owns me? Who owns me? That is the voice of prophecy to every single one of us this morning. Thus saith the Lord, I am the Lord thy God. So when you claim you for yours, listen to what the voice of Moses would say to you. Let my person go. Let my person go. Surrender your authority, your power over you to him who claims the authority over you because he made you. We talk about all the time, give your life to Christ, 
surrender to the Lord. But do you understand what it means? It means I deny my power and ownership over myself at the most fundamental level. Where I live, where I work, the means and manner of my death. I yield everything, all that I might claim for myself. There are all kinds of ways in which we articulate this. You already have this morning. Worship. Worship. This says, I'm not going to do what I want to do this morning. Watch a rerun of your favorite football team beating the Antichrist. Um, (laughs) I'm not going to do what I want to do. I'm going to focus on him. I'm going to worship him. That's the reason that worship is called a sacrifice. Giving is a sacrifice. I deny absolute ownership over what I think I own, and I say I don't own it at all. I give because it's his. My life, who I date, who I marry, where I work, how I talk, all of that is the result (laughs) of the fundamental friction between Moses and God. Let my people, let Every person go. They are all persons. So the voice of prophecy to us this morning is, to whatever extent you own you, God says, let my person go. Then let's deal with the issue of Nathan and David. This is a complicated relationship between Nathan and David because David the king David, uh, like I said, I wrote a whole book on David, and I'm not going to rehearse that this morning. But David was like the girl with the girl with the curl in the middle of her forehead. When he was good, he was very good, and when he was bad, he was horrid. So the relationship between Nathan the prophet and David the king was at times a relationship of, of profound confrontation and at times a relationship where the prophet shifted from being a confronter and became an advisor. That Nathan became almost the the palace priest, if you would. That he he was David's advisor, sidekick, counselor. What does that say to us? What does that say to us this morning? Sometimes the prophetic voice of the Holy Spirit confronts us. That is a sin. What What did Nathan say to David? You want to talk about speaking truth to power? You want to talk about speaking truth to power? When you look up at the king who has this sovereign power to have you executed, there's no rule, there's no law, David is the law. And you look the king in the eye and say, you're the man. You are the man. God has revealed to me everything you did. He revealed to me that you seduced that man's wife, you impregnated her, you tried to palm the baby off on him. When that didn't work, you conspired with one of your generals to have him murdered. You're an adulterer, a conspirator, a thief, and you're a murderer. You're the man. Now, movie star, that's speaking power to that's speaking truth to power. And David could have had him killed. All David had to do was snap his finger. And Joab, Joab was David's hitman. I always said to the kids at the university, if David was Wyatt Earp, Joab was Doc Holliday. He would bust a cap in you for a quarter. All David had to do was snap his fingers, and Joab would have taken Nathan's head off and, had, and slept that night. But instead, David said, that's truth. It's all truth. The spirit of prophecy, therefore, can be the spirit of conviction that comes to us and says, thou art the man. You're who I'm talking to. You're who I'm... Why, why does... It's amusing, isn't it, when angry people deny the reality of God? They're really angry. There's no such thing as God. I say, yeah, well, what are you angry about? <laughs> because I, I don't believe in God. I I know. I remember as a rebellious teenager standing in the back row of revival meetings, gripping the pew in front of me until my knuckles turned white, saying, I don't believe in any of this. I don't believe in this. No, then what was I fighting? I always say that the prophetic, convicting voice of the Holy Spirit is like an American physician. 
You ever go to a, a doctor with a say, you got a sore place right here. Sore place. <laughs> What's the first thing he does? Push on it. <laughs> he says, does that hurt? He said, yes, it hurts. I told you. That's why I'm here. It hurts. Does he stop? No. He said, what about if I do this? What if I hit it? If I kick it, does that, any of that hurt? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He twinges us in a worship service. The preacher's preaching on something. You ever, you ever hear this? Here's one. I know I've mentioned this. But this is, oh, all they ever preach on is money. Money, money, money. It's all they ever preach on. No, that's, it's just that that's all you ever hear. The spirit, of, the spirit of conviction always betrays us. There are five old sleepy dogs laying up under an oak tree on a hot July afternoon, and a mischievous child takes a rock and throws at them. They may all scatter, but the one that yelps the loudest is the one that got hit. The voice of prophecy, the voice of prophecy can be the voice of conviction. That probes us. Thou art the man. You're who I'm talking to. But that same voice of prophecy. Nathan is the voice of prophecy. The same one can advise and comfort and counsel and teach us. We don't have to fear the Holy Spirit. Because that same voice of prophecy comes to us and says, let me teach you. Let me show you how to handle this. Let, I, can, I can give you advice here. The counsel of the Holy Spirit is also the voice of prophecy. The third is Ahab to, is Elijah to Ahab. You may be a little less familiar with Elijah and Ahab and their relationship than you are with David and Nathan. So let me just rehearse it for you a bit. Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, as uh, the southern kingdom was Judah with its capital at Jerusalem. The northern kingdoms, uh, Israel, its capital was at Samaria at the end of the Jezreel Valley. Ahab married this wicked, um, idolatrous woman, Jezebel. And she and he introduced um, idolatry into the, into the fabric of the nation. It became endemic. She was the patron of 400 idols, false, the priests of false idols, and 450 false prophets. And so that's 850 that are paid by the queen of Israel. The fundamental truth of which is thou shalt love the Lord thy God and worship him only. And so the queen of that nation is now, is now bringing Idols and the idol worship and false prophecy that's around those idols into the fabric of the nation. So Elijah says, assemble all the people at Mount Carmel. And you, re you remember the, the conflict. He says to the, to the um, priests of the idols, the false of Baal and Astarte and the others, false idols. He says, you make an, you make a, a, an altar and p stack the wood up, put a sacrifice on it, slaughter a beast, put the, the pieces of the, of the meat on the altar. I'll do the same thing. You go first. Don't, don't put any fire on it. Pray and let whichever God that sends fire, let him be God. Whoever sends the fire, let him be God. You know what I think? I wasn't there, regardless of what these young people think. <laughs> but you know what I think? I think a chill ran down their spine right that minute. I think something inside of them said, this could go south. So they did exactly what he said, and all oh, the religion, it says they leapt on the altar, they did all kinds of incantations. They prayed until finally they took lancets and cut themselves until their blood gushed out on the altar. The true God gives his blood for your sins. A false God demands your blood for him. And 
at the end of it, it all the whole thing, Elijah, talk about truth to power. Elijah is mocking them. It's, it's, it's a comical scene. He says, oh, we know Baal is real. We know he's real. He's probably just fallen asleep. Let's wake him up. So he's walking up and down. Baal, wake up. Your, your guys are calling, wake up, wake up. And then it's not clear in English, but it's clear in Hebrew. He says, maybe he's just in the toilet. Maybe, maybe he's just gone to the bathroom. We'll go. Let's, come on out. Come on out. And so finally the priests of Baal say, okay, okay, big shot. Now you go. If you're, if you're so great, you go. Elijah says, not yet. Bring barrels of water and pour water on the sacrifice. Drench it. Drench the sacrifice, drench the wood, drench the stones. It says they dig a trench around it until it flows as deep, the water is as deep in the trench as a bushel of wheat. And now the priests of Baal are really gloating. If he ever could have prayed down fire, he can't now. He's, he's made his own game harder. He told us he beat us and, and he put the quarterback on the bench. There's no way he's beaten us. And does he leap on the altar? Does he go through all kinds of religiosity? He doesn't. He says, oh, Lord, let the God who answers by fire be God. And pow, the fire comes. It burns up the sacrifice. It burns the stones. It burns the wood. It burns the water. It leaps into the trench and burns the water like Mexican oil. It just burns the whole thing up. And then... Then Elijah says, if God is God, then serve him. And the people, and listen what the people answered. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now look at these three prophets and what they, who they spoke to and what they wanted. Moses spoke to Pharaoh about the ownership of the people of God. So he was not dealing with Pharaoh. He wasn't trying to straighten Pharaoh's life out. He doesn't convict Pharaoh about anything. He's not even dealing with the sin of slavery is a sin, but that's not what he's dealing with. He's dealing with the people of God, but he's confronting Pharaoh about ownership. Nathan is confronting David about his own sins. Elijah doesn't deal with Ahab at all. He's a lost cause. He's dealing with the people of God. So look at these three things. One prophet deals with the liberty of the people. The second deals with the king of the people. The, the authority of the people. Thou art the man. He's not dealing with Israel. He's dealing with David. The third man, the third prophet deals with the, with the righteousness of the people. The liberty of the people, the deliverance of the people, righteous leadership, and the ownership of God. The voice of prophecy usward in every generation is the same as it comes through Moses or Elijah or Nathan. Now, the problem is this. The challenge is this. How does it sound... In our generation. How does it sound? I want to say this. This may be the most controversial thing I say all morning. I'm an equal opportunity preacher. I, I try to offend all of you. <laughs> but here it is. There is a difference between speaking prophetically and being a prophet like Elijah was. So there, is a, there may be prophetic voices. There may be those who speak to the nation or to us. But it's, it's different. When we get too easy and frivolous about the word prophecy, it begins to cheapen the whole thing. Here's a word I don't have to... If I was preaching this morning in a Baptist church, I don't even have to say this. But in a Spearfield church, you have to say it. Not everybody that says, Thus saith the Lord, has heard from God. And we, we, we have to be more discerning. 
We have to be more discerning. Every one of us, you've been somewhere in some spirit-filled church where somebody stands up to start a word of prophecy and you can tell from the first sentence that he's got one wheel in the ditch. It's just meaningless babble and you know it is not from God. But he has started with, thus saith the Lord. And so everybody is cowed. We all, oh, praise God, praise God. And we're all thinking, oh, God, this guy's nuts. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, if God would help? Wouldn't it be nice if he stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, and God's voice would come out of heaven. No, I didn't. This dude is on his own. But that's the reason that the gifts of the Spirit are received in community. Because we must test the spirits. We must try the spirits. Not everybody that says he's a prophet is a prophet. And there are not prophets among us who are like Elijah in the sense of being a prophet. They may be prophetic voices. The second thing is this. That we must receive the prophetic voices of the present age. Thoughtfully and discerning the spirit. Testing the spirits. And we must receive it personally. The prophetic voice that speaks to the present generation is still speaking truth to power. The only thing is, we are the power. We must hear, you are the man. We must be the one that sits upon the throne of our own lives and says, come, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Speak to me. So where do we land? We land with this. The end of all prophecy is what the book of Revelation told us in the 19th chapter. Jesus. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The Lordship of Christ. God who in various times in diverse manners, Hebrews chapter 1, hath in the past spoken unto us through his prophets, hath in these days spoken unto us through his Son, through his word. And the angel said, don't worship angels. Worship angels. I serve God just like you do. The spirit of prophecy is Jesus. The fulfillment, the power, the, the authority of all true prophecy, of every prophetic utterance in every age until the return of Christ is Jesus. So that we are brought by prophecy to the same place where the people were on Mount Carmel. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. We are living in strenuous times. We are living in strenuous times. We have been spoiled in the church in the United States and the church in the West. To such an extent that we think this is the worst time ever. We said, that is the worst thing that's ever happened. I was recently on a panel. Somebody on the panel said, America has never been this polarized before. I said, well, okay, there was this thing called the Civil War. (laughs) We were fairly polarized. Brother against brother. State against state, a nation ruptured. We have been this polarized before. And so we've never never had this level of corruption in American government. I said, oh, my dear friend, buy a history book. (laughs) No, people are people. Politicians are politicians. This is a complicated age. It's a difficult time. I'm not denying that. We are standing in the midst of a pandemic. However... The pandemic in 1918, the Spanish flu, was far more lethal, far more dangerous. This this is a terrible time, but it's not the worst time ever. So what, what, what does the voice of prophecy say to us in this time? What is the fundamental, the quintessence of the voice of prophecy? What does it say to us? The people of God belong to the God of the people. The conviction of God is the voice of God to every person. 
the counsel of God leads us to this one great proclamation, personally and corporately, were the whole world to burst into flames tomorrow, where every battle that's ever been fought, fought all at one time, the people of God say, the spirit of prophecy has revealed to us, Jesus is Lord, no matter what. Jesus is Lord. That's prophecy. Let me pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this precious church and for these people and for every person that is here. Speak, O Lord, your children here. Lord, we want to be your people. Each of us wants to be a person of yours. We want to be yours exclusively, totally, personally yours. And we want Jesus to be Lord of our lives. In that mighty name, that holy name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, and God bless this great church. Just thank God for this word today. Come on, would you stand? I'm going to be giving it to our campus pastors in just a moment. But before you walk out here, can we, can we just do something? There's an old chorus that right before we dismiss, it says you are Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee will bow. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Jesus Christ is Lord. Would you sing it this way? You're my Lord. You're my Lord. You're my Lord. You have risen. You have risen from the dead. And you, my Lord, every knee, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. Father, I pray for our campus pastors as they take the service there in Fayetteville and Madison and Smith Lake. And as online continues to join with me, God, speak to every heart that we would respond to your word. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. You know, you're in this room or you're watching online today. We can only say Jesus is Lord by His Spirit. There's been such a peaceful atmosphere here today. Because I believe Lord didn't want any distractions for you to hear the Word and to allow the Word to come and go deep inside of you. Whether it's conviction, whether He's calling you to Himself saying, I gave my life for you so you can give your life to me, surrender to me. And if you're here today, you need Jesus. It's not a mystical prayer. You pray. It is repentance and it's turning from your way, from your sin and turning to him and saying, Lord, I abandon the thing you've got to understand is we're all sinners and we have need of a savior. The savior's name is Jesus. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And through that, it's none works. Nothing I could do to ever earn that. Nothing. No good deed, 
No going out and helping the poor, trying to help someone in my neighborhood. Nothing. Nothing could earn it. The only thing I can do is by grace look and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need, I need, I need forgiveness. I cannot forgive myself. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come into my life and change me. I give you me. And it's turning in that place, surrendering your life to him and following Jesus the rest of your life and becoming a disciple of him. Acknowledging who he is. A prayer can only speak what a heart says. But if the heart is not saying it, every word you would even say in your mouth brings no justification to what's going on in your life until you say, here, I give up my life. I make you the owner and the Lord of my life. Father, I pray for that, for everyone in the sound of my voice. That, Lord, we would not be content with living in the sin we have justified. But, God, we would turn our back on that and turn our face toward the one who became that sin for me and surrender and say, Jesus, here, I give you all I have. I give you my life. I give you my hopes. I give you my, my past, my present, my future, all my hopes, my dreams. I surrender all to you. I turn from my way and I turn to you. Jesus, here, be the Lord of my life. Be my Lord, my master, my soon coming king. I pray today that, Lord, as we, as we transition this service, as we, Lord, pronounce a benediction, that it would not be that for us. But, Lord, it would be a day of a new beginning, a fresh start, a, be, a day of being born again by the Spirit of God. I pray for that right now in Jesus' name. You know, if, you, if that's your heart today, can I ask you, there's a, there's a card maybe or online they're about to put up a, a you, what, what you can just text. We'll send a card. It doesn't mean you're saved when you check a box and a card, but we want to walk with you. He said, go make disciples. Don't go make American Christians. He said, go make disciples. A disciple is someone who picks up his cross and follows Jesus. And man, it'll change, he will change your life. He'll change your hopes, your dreams, everything about you. He will change the way you think and the way you live and the way you love. And he'll set your feet on a rock that's unmovable. And that's not this church. That is the rock Jesus, my friend. He loves you today. But if you will let us, we'll follow you. We'll walk with you. We'll, we'll disciple you. We'll care for you. And man, I believe with all of my heart, you will find the journey of a lifetime that will take you through eternity. He's faithful today. Amen. Could somebody give the Lord praise? Can you do that? And today, that is the altar call today. I'm not going to invite people forward, but if you need prayer, we have leaders that will be up here to pray for you. I want to encourage you on your way out. Stop by. Get this. Um, did you receive? How many just enjoyed this word today, man? Stop by. This is a general in the Lord, man. And I know this book is going to meet life to you. But if you need prayer, these altars are open. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you, to be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you, give you peace, write his name on you, and say you belong to me. Don't miss next Sunday. God has been stirring something in me the last two weeks that I believe is going to minister to your life. Bring someone, bring a friend, bring a neighbor. Come on, let's crank this thing back up. It's time to awaken and arise and shine. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled week.